Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly briefing. Um, this week, we will hear from Public Health, from our Community Development Division, and from our Planning Division. Just like to note as we get started that it is still Women's History Month, um, and you may not have known, but this week is Wisconsin Water Week. So please be uh, thankful for the clean water in uh, coming from your tap and our amazing water resources here in the Madison area, our lakes and rivers and creeks. Um, and while you're at it, thank somebody who works in the water industry. All right, as always, we'll start with public health, and today we have Doug Vagley with us. Thank you, Mayor, for giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss some of the uh, changes uh, that we're seeing in the pandemic, um, which was declared uh, just one year ago today uh, was the uh, official declaration of the pandemic for the COVID-19. So we've been in this for a year, and I'm happy to say that I think that we're going to be getting out of it soon. Uh, as of yesterday, 21.9% of our population in Dane County, that's more than one out of five, have gotten at least one dose of vaccine. Uh, we've delivered 119 thousand vaccines total. Uh, that's with uh, public health, our uh, federal uh, pharmacy uh, program, uh, which would be Walgreens, Pick and Saves, um, and then uh, as well as our healthcare systems who are uh, picking up a lion's share of our vaccination uh, and, and vaccinating the individuals that they serve. So we're super uh, grateful for all of our partners that are helping to get this vaccine out into our community as quickly as possible. 14% of our population have completed their series. Um, and that means both doses for Pfizer and Moderna or one dose for the Johnson & Johnson, which we just received this week, uh, in order to take care of our educator and our child care population. Um, we're thrilled that uh, three out of four individuals uh, over 65 have uh, been vaccinated. Uh, that's a higher risk group, uh, as you know, um, and it's great that we have the opportunity to get the, uh, the 65 plus population vaccinated as quickly as possible to help reduce the transmission and the illness that uh, is from uh, COVID-19. Uh, as you may know, we're running an educator and child care clinic right now at the Alliant Energy Center. They're running very smoothly. Uh, and we anticipate that we'll be completed with this group by the 21st of March. Um, again, this is a collaborative initiative. All of our healthcare systems and the University of Wisconsin-Madison are contributing staff so that we can move through this group as quickly as possible and move on to our next groups. We are already starting to invite our next groups uh, in anticipation of finishing up the child care and educator group uh, so invites are being sent out for our Medicaid uh, individuals and long-term care programs. Some public-facing workers, our 911 operators, our transit operators, uh, our utility operators, as the mayor just talked about, our, our water uh, utility, um, they are all in line now to uh, get vaccinated and invites are going out as we speak. So make sure to check your in-mail, uh, your uh, inboxes, uh, your email and your spam folders. It may be going there as well. After we're done with this group, we'll move on to our next groups, our non-frontline healthcare personnel, and then finally our congregate living, which would include those that don't have shelter or are incarcerated. We'll be hopefully standing up a couple mobile vaccine teams. Uh, we're anticipating that we'll have some uh, teams ready to go uh, by the 21st of March. And hopefully we can push those teams out and get into areas of our community that may be underserved at this point in time or may not have the ability to come to the Alliant Energy Center for vaccine. We also anticipate that today the Department of Health Services may make an announcement that would uh, further define uh, the next tier, tier 1C. Uh, we anticipate that this will include individuals with health conditions. They may lower the age to 55 plus, uh, and they may also include more essential workers. Uh, we'll find out more later today, I hope, when uh, they put out uh, their uh, definitions for the next tier. 
We've scaled up our operations at uh, AEC. When I, when I wrote this, uh, my notes, I had 5,200 uh, that we can do per week. Uh, we've moved that up now to 5,700 uh, as we've become more efficient in our process of administering vaccines. We hope that we're able to use the Wisconsin COVID vaccine registry soon. Uh, we're currently uh, working with DHS to make the adjustments necessary for it to work at our high throughput community vaccination site at AEC. When we get this system online, uh, we can move up to 7,000 doses a week. So we're anxious to get this online so that we can increase our capacity because we want to get our community vaccinated as quickly as possible. We're also anticipating uh, more vaccine supply. Um, Department of Health Services has been telling us that uh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And I really think that in three weeks we will have enough uh, vaccine on hand to be able to open up our access, our site uh, much wider to a larger population. Which is, which is great to be able to say this now, one year from uh, when the pandemic was declared that we, we could possibly be seeing uh, in, in a few months uh, a drastic uh, change um, in our communities uh, as we are able to open up more as more people are vaccinated and our cases continue to decline. And I'm really hopeful that this summer is going to look much different than last summer and, and hope that uh, we can keep moving in that direction. And we can keep moving in that direction if you get vaccinated, if you continue to wear your masks, continue to distance, and uh, continue to avoid large gatherings where COVID transmission may occur. Again, hopefully this summer will be much different than next summer. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I had the chance to go down to the Alliant Energy Center this week and uh, visit with some of the teachers that are, were in line to get their vaccine. Uh, it was a very... Um, very exciting moment, I think. Everybody I talked to was, was really eager uh, to get the Johnson & Johnson shot and um, be done uh, with being vaccinated and, and eager to, to uh, be able to get back to uh, something closer to normal life. So again, really encourage everybody, when it is your turn, please do sign up and get the vaccine, whether that's uh, through public health or through your healthcare provider. Uh, we are obviously making a lot more available, and I want to thank everybody who's made that possible uh, at the city, the county, public health, the state, and the federal government, uh, because it's really a collaboration um, between all levels of government and our healthcare partners uh, who have been absolutely essential uh, in this whole process. All right, next we're going to hear from Lynette Rhodes from our Community Development Division, and she will be talking about our plans for a permanent homeless shelter on the east side. Hello, I'm Lynette Rose from the city's Community Development Division, just one of the city agencies who has been moving forward on a plan to find a location to place a purpose-built permanent shelter for homeless men. For the past 35 years, our community has relied on the generous support of downtown churches for space to accommodate men overnight. While these spaces provide a warm place to sleep, we have heard feedback from service providers and from individuals who have used the space that is not the most successful way to help people transition out of homelessness. The COVID-19 pandemic elevated the need for the city and county to look for safer space for men facing housing insecurity. We first set up a temporary site at Warner Park and then later relocated to the former fleet building on First Street. I'm here to talk about the city and county's desire to buy a site on Zaire Road as the final location to create a purpose-built shelter. The site is close to transportation options and employment opportunities for individuals. We hope and anticipate that at this location, men can have a safe space to shelter throughout the night while also gaining access to support services during the day that they might not have utilized prior to this opportunity. It's estimated that during the winter, we have about 250 men experiencing homelessness in our community. Some of those men will not seek shelter. Some find refuge with friends or family, but we strive to ensure that in the most extreme cold weather nights, 
that people who have no other resources can at least find a safe shelter opportunity. Our goal beyond finding safe accommodations at night is also to have access to the services that will support them on a journey to sustainable housing options. We plan to build a shelter that is right-sized for our community needs. We are continuing to evaluate what that means with our city's engineering team and soon with a design firm. And we anticipate that a shelter um, will not expand beyond our current needs. The full process of development, once the site is purchased, will take until the fall of 2022. During that time, we plan to engage with the surrounding community, with people who have lived experiencing using past shelters, um, and with our service providers, so we can evaluate the design and the service needs for a full functioning shelter. Many people recognize that Madison is a strong community where many people seek to flourish. For us to build back better after this pandemic, we need to ensure the most vulnerable in our community have that opportunity and have a place to go at night. Alder Balde has organized a neighborhood meeting for tomorrow, March 12th at 6 p.m. if you'd like any more details on this project. We also are available in the Community Development Division to answer any questions. Thank you, Lynette. I just want to emphasize how important this project is to our community. Uh, we have an obligation to make sure that everybody has access to a safe place to be um, overnight. And, and my vision for this shelter is one that not only provides that safe place to sleep, but also serves the whole array of needs that we see in our homeless community whether that's connecting folks to treatment or to training or to employment, uh, but ultimately to permanent housing. Um, and my vision for this site is that all of those services will be available right there on site to best serve this community. Um, so I'm very hopeful that we have a chance coming out of this pandemic to really change the way that we approach homeless services in this community um, and to just leapfrog forward into a much better place uh, for our entire community. And I hope that you all will take a moment to learn more about the project um, and come to support it. Thanks, Lynette, for the update on that. Now we turn to Linda Horvath from our planning division who will be talking about our neighborhood grant program. Thank you, Mayor, and good morning to the press. I'm Linda Horbeth with the City's Planning Division, and I'm here to let folks know that Monday, March 15th at 4.30 p.m. is the deadline for our neighborhood grant program. Groups of five or more residents, neighborhood associations, business associations, and other groups are eligible to apply for a small grant to help them beautify public places and to build leadership and capacity of their organizations. While the deadline is just a few days away, um, it's really quite simple to apply. Um, groups can answer the questions online. They can handwrite the form. They can answer by email, or they can submit a video application. English, Spanish, and Hmong application materials are available, and those can be found on the city's webpage at www.cityofmadison.com. Last year, Crawford, Marlboro, and Nakoma conducted a placemaking project. Um, they put in native, native plantings, and they put in a gathering space underneath the Winona Ped Bike Bridge over the Beltline. <clears throat> Also last year, Emerson Neighborhood dedicated their People's Pronoun Sculpture, which is along Pennsylvania Avenue, with a virtual uh, coloring book through their neighborhood newsletter. And in previous years, uh, Bayview, as one example, in 2019, did their Bayview Portraits Project, where they interviewed families and they uh, took portraits of them and displayed the portraits um, throughout the community center and also in some of the public libraries. In 2019 as well, Truex and Hawthorne neighborhoods brightened the tunnel underneath East Washington Avenue at Wright Street with a beautiful community mural. And in 2017, Worthington Park Neighborhood Association and the Eastside Planning Council put together their pop-up market where they featured locally made goods and also had some bands playing during the pop-up market. 
We strongly encourage folks to um, get in touch with us if you want to apply. However, if that's not possible before Monday, please go ahead and submit an application. Uh, again, my name is Linda Horvath, and my colleague Anya Puerta and I are available to answer any questions. Uh, just send us an email at neighborhoods at cityofmadison.com. Uh, we want to help groups uh, while the neighborhoods are, or while the grants are small, um, the community building impact is generally quite huge with these projects. So apply by Monday at 4.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Those grants are really a great opportunity uh, for neighbors and friends to come together around a, a little project that will improve your community. I know my neighborhood has taken advantage of this grant program in the past uh, to good effect. I have a number of updates as usual. Uh, I want to start by taking a moment to celebrate uh, the $1.9 trillion rescue package that just passed Congress this week and is awaiting the President's signature tomorrow. I want to thank President Biden for delivering this promised aid to our country and our community and a huge thank you to everyone in Congress who voted for it. This historic aid package will help Madison and Madison's most vulnerable residents get on the road to recovery. Uh, while the $1,400 payments for families have generated most of the headlines, it's the money for low-income families with children that could have the greatest impact in our community. The bill expands existing tax credits for families with children, which will deliver checks for as much as $300 a month to eligible families. Researchers say that this tax credit, along with other components of the bill, will cut child poverty in the U.S. by half. That's a remarkable impact and one that is much needed in our communities. This is great news for the nation and for our residents here in Madison. Other funding that will aid Madison includes funding to ensure protection from COVID-19, including access to vaccination and testing, rental assistance, food assistance, childcare help, and broadband access, support for broad-based business recovery and job creation, including funding for small businesses and restaurants, funding to restore and expand transit access, and funding to expand affordable housing. We have a hardworking city staff team uh, figuring out ways to optimize these funds and prepare a plan for the use of the funds that are coming directly to the city of Madison. I'll be providing further updates soon uh, as that funding rolls out. But today, we're celebrating the historic achievement of a responsive federal government who takes the concerns of its people seriously. So thank you again to the president and everybody who made that possible. All right, I know, I know you're thinking we were done with elections for the year, but no, we're not. Uh, we have the spring election coming up on April 6th, and it is time to start thinking about it. Uh, so first of all, please uh, make sure that for all your election needs, you visit the clerk's office website, that's cityofmadison.com slash clerk. Um, and there you can find out all sorts of information about how you register to vote, uh, what you need in order to vote, getting the right voter ID, uh, how to request an absentee ballot, when you can vote uh, early uh, in-person absentee, and where your polling place is to vote on April 6th. So lots of questions that you can get answered there. Um, I just want to run through a little bit of what is on your spring election ballot um, so that you can understand how important it is for you to vote in this election. So quickly, several offices are up for election on April 6th. We have statewide, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. There is a multiple Dane County Circuit Court judge branches uh, that are up, 2, 6, 7, 9, 10, 12, 13, and 17. That's a lot of judges. You might want to do your homework on those. The Dane County Executive uh, uh, will be on your ballot. Two Dane County Board Supervisor Districts, uh, Districts 4 and 12, are, are up for election. Uh, the City of Madison Municipal Judge is on the ballot, and all districts uh, for the City of Madison Common Council uh, are on the ballot. In addition, uh, all the we have school district races. So for the Madison Metropolitan School District, seats 1 and 2 on the school board are up. 
Um, so that's a lot of races. Those are, those are all people who impact the, your lives, the life of our community, um, and you want to make sure that you are um, electing people that you support into those positions. There will also be four advisory referendum questions on the ballot. These questions are non-binding, um, which means that any implementation of the actions or policies will require further action by either the council or, or through a binding referendum. But four non-binding questions on the ballot um, that I want to make people aware of. The first, and I'm just going to read and paraphrase what these questions are so you can start to get familiar with them, but I do encourage you, again, to visit the clerk's office, to visit the city council website where you'll be able to find more information about these questions. So the first question asks um, if, beginning with the 2023 spring election, the city of Madison should transition to a full-time common council with each common council member earning between 50 and 80 percent of the adjusted median income for Dane County? And that's a yes or no. The second question says that we currently have a part-time common council comprised of 20 older persons, one from each district, and asks, should, beginning with the 2023 spring election, the size of the Madison Common Council, and here you have three options, right? Should it be reduced, should it be increased, or should it remain the same? So that's a question about how many alders we should have. The third question uh, is that we're, we currently have council members elected to two-year terms, and should they transition to being elected to four-year terms? Yes or no question. And the last question on the ballot is uh, currently the council is not subject to term limits, and so starting in 2023, should uh, there be term limits of 12 consecutive years for common council members? Another yes or no question. So four really important questions uh, for the future of our community, for the future of our city government. I encourage you to uh, read up on the exact language of the questions, to educate yourself about the issues, and to form an opinion uh, so you'd be ready to vote on April 6 uh, on these questions. Um, you can find out much more, again, on the clerk's website. There are maps of the Dane County Board Districts um, on the Dane County Board of Supervisors website, so you can see if you live in District uh, 4 or 12. Um, and the City of Madison Assessor's Office website um, lets you look up what aldermanic district and what school district you live in. So if you go to the property lookup page, enter your address, uh, and it will show you um, what, who your representatives are, what districts you live in. Um, and then you'll be able to view a sample ballot for your address on the My Vote uh, Wisconsin website starting on March 16th. So please, again, get ready to vote. Uh, make sure you're registered. Make sure you have proper ID. Make sure you have a plan to vote. And educate yourself about what's on that ballot. All right, yesterday we reduce, uh, we uh, um, announced a plan uh, to reduce violence in Madison and Dane County. Uh, we released a comprehensive violence prevention plan that provides a roadmap for a collective community action. It's called Madison Dane County Violence Prevention, a Roadmap to Reducing Violence. Um, and it's a five-year plan that's guided by a public health approach to violence prevention and provides five evidence-based goals and accompanying strategies and objectives for those goals. The plan recognizes violence as a public health crisis that is preventable through coordinated and sustained effort that requires shared ownership and leadership across our entire community. The five goals of the plan include understanding violence in our community through data, supporting community engagement with children, youth, and families, fostering strong neighborhoods, bolstering and increasing intervention and continuous healing for those who are affected by violence, and strengthening community capacity, collaboration, and coordination of violence prevention efforts. We know that violence in our community is inherently linked to social inequities and that preventing violence includes investment in efforts to address health, racial, and gender inequities. A public health approach is particularly important because it understands this interconnectedness. Over the coming months, Public Health Madison and Dane County will present an in-depth introduction to the roadmap. We're in the process of hiring two new positions to add capacity to our violence prevention unit, and we'll be working with data partners to develop uh, plan evaluation metrics, and we'll be reconvening the Madison Dane County Violence Prevention Coalition to start on implementation of this really important roadmap. 
Um, to learn more, please visit the Public Health Madison Dane County website. Um, we do have a violence prevention unit there that is working hard um, on this plan and its implementation. All right, just to note, uh, if somehow you missed it, uh, we do have some of our Madison K-12 students that are actually heading back to school into the school buildings. So that means that it is time again to watch out for our crossing guards and our young pedestrians uh, out there on the streets. So we're reminding all drivers to keep watch for crossing guards that are assisting children and families uh, walking and biking to and from school as the school district starts to phase in a return to in-person learning. Um, please remember to slow down in school zones, yield to people in crosswalks, and drive with caution at all times. If a crossing guard is signaling for you to stop, you are required to stop no closer than 10 feet and no less than 30 feet from that crossing guard. And by law, you must remain stopped until both the children and the crossing guard have returned to the curb. You do have to yield to people in crosswalks, that's state law. Um, and when you're turning, please remember to look for people who are walking or biking across the street. Slow down in school zones and at intersections that are monitored by crossing guards. Um, and you have to assume that that speed limit in those zones is 15 miles per hour. Um, and this is really important just for the safety of everybody in our community. A person who is hit by a motor vehicle traveling at 20 miles per hour has only a 13% 13 chance, 13 chance of being killed or seriously injured. But at 30 miles per hour, there's a 40% chance uh, of being killed or getting seriously injured. So your speed really does make a difference um, in keeping our community safe. And please just remember to drive safely throughout our community, particularly now that we have more kids out um, on the street headed to and from school. Also, if you care about these issues, um, we are looking for more crossing guards. And we're looking to hire more crossing guards. It's about 10 to 15 hours a week, and there's still time to apply for these jobs. Uh, the job position posting closes tomorrow. So uh, if you're interested in the hourly crossing guard position, visit governmentjobs.com slash careers slash Madison WI. Um, or you can visit our traffic engineering uh, website for more information about the program. I do also want to note um, that we gave an update this week on uh, the process of creating an alternative emergency response for our community. Um, we are piloting uh, this new model of crisis intervention and service delivery to better need, meet the needs of our residents. Uh, we know that the Madison Police Department currently receives a very large number of calls that are related to mental or behavioral health. It's about 7,000 calls a year, and that's about 20 per day, so that's a pretty high volume. Uh, and we know that an armed officer is not always the best response to every emergency call for many reasons. Only a small portion of these calls involve a person who is a danger to themselves or to others. So that leaves a lot of room for this alternative response team that we're putting together. So we're working to develop, to develop a two-person teams consisting of a paramedic and a crisis worker, both with clinical experience and training in trauma-informed de-escalation and harm reduction techniques that will respond to this range of behavioral health calls. Uh, we've funded the pilot through uh, my 2021 budget, and city staff, have, uh, led by the fire department's emergency medical services team, have been working hard to put this pilot together. We're partnering very closely with the county uh, and with the county's designated crisis responders at Journey Mental Health to work out the details of how to hire, train, supervise, and dispatch these teams. Um, we are currently in the process of hiring two community paramedics for this program. We're reviewing data from recent years and developing effective and culturally competent training and evaluation systems. We're also working to confirm the days, times, and locations of the first phase of the program. And we continue to learn from other programs around the nation, including those in Eugene, Denver, and San Francisco. Um, so I'm just really excited about this project and that we're actually starting to see it come to fruition. We're going to be able to get this, these teams on the street soon. I really encourage you, we are still hiring for those two community paramedic positions. If you're interested, again, um, visit the City of Madison website, citymadison.com, and click on the jobs link. Um, you'll see it in the listing there. Um, and please help us find some great people uh, to provide this really important service for our community. 
All right, the Streets Division is announcing a master recycler program. Um, this is developed in close partnership with Sustain Dane, um, who will be administering the master recycling courses. Um, and I'd like to thank the Carlton Council uh, for a grant to Sustain Dane that helps make this possible. Uh, individuals who sign up to become a master recycler will look, learn about our local recycling program, how to be a better recycler at home, but also how to reach out to your family, neighbors, friends, and coworkers about uh, improving their recycling habits. One thing that I know we all need to work on is the practice of wish cycling, where you put something in the recycling bin that you wish was recyclable. Uh, but in fact is not. So if you're interested in recycling and want to become a master recycler, you can learn more at the Sustained Dane website, or you can find out more information about our recycling program at cityofmadison.com slash recycling. And those are my announcements for the week. Now I just want to run through, as usual, some community resources that might be useful for folks um, and some upcoming meetings. Um, so if you are in need uh, of housing, if you're homeless or in danger of losing your housing, please contact the City Housing Helpline. It is 608-264-0549 or email housinginfo at cityofmadison.com and shout out to Lynette and her team for making that possible. If you need help connecting to internet service or phone service, you can call 608-267-3595. That's the state's public service commission line. If you need help finding a child care provider, call 608-216-7022. To identify nearby emergency food options or connect to many, many other social services that are available to you in this community, call United Way of Dane County at 211 or text your zip code to 898-211. The city does offer a free financial resource hotline to help residents navigate issues uh, due to COVID-19. You can learn more at cityofmadison.com slash financial hotline or call 608-315-5151 to get more information and to sign up. Uh, we, the um, federal healthcare marketplace uh, is open until May 15th at healthcare.gov. If you need help getting uh, your healthcare coverage through the marketplace, Covering Wisconsin can help you navigate that. And so if you need that, you can visit wiscovered.com or call 211 and they'll connect you to those resources. And if you need help paying uh, your premiums for 2021 through the health care exchange, United Way of Dane County has a Health Connect program um, that supports lower income individuals. Um, you must live in Dane County, be a U.S. citizen or legal residence, enroll in a marketplace health plan, and fall within a certain income range. To learn more, again, call 211 or visit unitedwaydanecounty.org slash healthconnect uh, for more information. And since you probably need access to a computer to access many of these resources, I just want to remind folks that our fantastic libraries have been open uh, f this entire time to help people connect to internet resources. You can get an appointment to use a computer um, at our libraries. Um, you can make a, an, a, an appointment by calling the libraries um, or signing up online. And the number to call is 608-315-5151. And thanks to our libraries and our librarians who are keeping that service available for our community. These resources and many, many more are posted at cityofmadison.com. Click on the community resources link. You can also learn more about uh, all the sorts of things that I've been talking about today at my blog, which is cityofmadison.com slash mayor slash blog. You can sign up uh, to get it delivered to your inbox. Find out much more information about the city and state resources and current events and legislation. Finally, upcoming meetings today at 2.30. The Early Childhood Care and Education Committee meets at 3. The Sustainable Madison Committee meets at 4.30. The Community Development Authority meets at 5. The Digital Technology Committee meets also at 5. The Board of Health and also at 5. The Equal Opportunities Commission. On Monday the 15th at noon, the Police and Fire Commission meets at 5. The Transportation Policy and Planning Board meets and also at 5. The Landmarks Commission. 
On Tuesday the 16th at 4.30, the Common Council Executive Committee will meet, and at 6.30, the Common Council will meet. And on Wednesday, March 17th at 3.30, the Personnel Board will meet, and at 5.30, the Alcohol License Review Committee will meet. Finally, please do not forget that on 3.14, daylight savings goes into effect. Bring forward, everybody. Um, and on March 15th, a uh, huge happy birthday to the late, great Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And that is my briefing for this week. Linda, do we have questions? Indeed we do. We are able to take two questions today, one for you and one for public health. All right, let's start with public health. Good morning, Doug. Um, this question is actually two parts, so bear with me as I read all the parts. Um, DHS plans to announce who is eligible for phase 1C today. Can you talk about the planning already in place to accommodate new groups eligible for the vaccine and how this will impact operations at the Alliant Energy Center? What progress is public health making on reaching and vaccinating communities of color and those who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19? Okay, the first question, um, I, we, it's kind of speculation what DHS will announce today, um, but from my listening to past state disaster medical advisory committee meetings, we anticipate that it'll be those individuals with health conditions as well as those 55 and over potentially, as well as opening up a lot more essential workers. The impact at AEC as well as our healthcare systems will be another group, another crowd of uh, people coming through for vaccination. If the supply is there, we have the capacity to be able to go through this group fairly quickly. Um, again, it goes back to supply. Uh, and I will just reiterate, I think that our supply is uh, at a, a turning point right now where in the next few weeks we will see uh, increased supply. If we have the supply, we have the capacity to move through this group as quickly as possible. The next group, we hope, is going to be the general public. The second question, we have uh, communications and working with community partners at trying to reduce hesitancy. We're holding several town halls uh, as public health department. We work with other groups uh, as well and putting on virtual town halls and trying to get out as much information as possible. We also have a lot of resources on our, our website, and we're developing fact sheets that would be uh, uh, geared and uh, uh, speak to our, our communities that may have some hesitancy. I also mentioned earlier um, our mobile vax teams. When we have the vaccine supply, we'll be able to take these teams on the road and go to specific areas that we're finding are underserved uh, at this point in time. So that, and then also we work closely with our healthcare partners um, and it's not just the public health department, it's the public health department plus UW Health, plus the University of Wisconsin, plus GHC, plus Access Community Health, uh, Uni Unity Point Meritor, and SSM Dean. I think I got them all. Um, they also are working with us in, common, in, in a collaborative effort to make sure that we are reaching all the different groups that may be hesitant or may lack access uh, to be able to do the drive-through model that we have at the Alliant. We recognize that not everybody can drive through. Um, and to that end, we do provide transportation if needed. Uh, at this point in time, uh, there's several different transportation options. But in the future, when we get through uh, this initial group of educators in childcare, Hopefully later on this month, we will have mobile vaccine teams that we can put into different areas to ensure that we are providing access to anybody that needs a uh, vaccine. We want to get you vaccinated. <laughs> okay, just one more question here for your, for your reflection. Um, it says one year ago uh, today, uh, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic because of coronavirus. Can the mayor and public health Please reflect on the last year, how we've responded, and what need what still needs to be done to start to return to normal. 
So, yeah, like I said, one year ago today, um, and I'm, I just have to say this too, it, it, it was my, um, my spouse's birthday and I forgot the birthday, <laughs> but I did not forget that it was uh, a pandemic one year ago today was declared. Uh, to that end, I think we've all seen the impact that it's had on our lives and the different approaches and avenues that we've taken to do anything we can to reduce the spread of COVID. Um, we continued to issue emergency orders uh, that would tighten things down to, again, just uh, trying to achieve that goal of uh, reducing transmission. Through all of our different actions uh, in our community, with our public health department, with all other departments and our residents uh, that are adhering to our orders, we've been able to drive these cases down. At one point in time, we were looking at 400 cases a day. Now we're down around 50. So we're at a point now where these, these cases are coming down. What we've done has worked. And the light at the end of the tunnel uh, is truly our, our vaccination efforts. Um, and the more the vaccine we can get in arms, which is really our goal, get as much vaccine in arms as possible, as quickly as possible, because we could be drawing this to an end. And like I said earlier, our summer should look and can look vastly different if we all are uh, in it together getting our vaccinations, uh, and we continue to drive this case count down. I'm sure that the mayor may have more to add. <laughs> Thank you so much. I do, I do just want to um, first add a, 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 just a tiny bit to what Doug said about uh, reaching our communities of color with vaccine. And um, I want to thank in particular um, the many partners that Doug mentioned, uh, because public health has been working with a number of partners to to really make sure that we do bring access to our communities of color. Um, UW Health has done a particularly good job at this, and I know that there's been several clinics particularly focused at our African-American community and our Hmong community to make sure that they have access to the vaccine. And I expect that those efforts to just continue. Um, again, as we're able to have those mobile vaccination teams and as we're able to continue, not just through public health, but through all the other vaccinators in our community um, to pop up clinics uh, in communities uh, for specific access there. Uh, something that we're all very committed to, making sure that the vaccine is distributed as equitably as possible in our community. Um, while, of course, we do want everyone to be vaccinated when it is their turn. So um, really encourage folks to pay attention to when you're eligible um, and to sign up as soon as you can. Uh, on the second question, I have been reflecting a lot uh, about the fact that it's a, we're a year in um, and it's been a really, really difficult year for our community. Um, I think, you know, you have to start by thanking Public Health Madison Dane County, who um, more than a year ago, um, starting uh, a year ago, January, we're really paying attention to the progress of the COVID-19 virus and what it was, what was happening around the world, what we might expect to see here, and to start ramping up the preparations for that. Um, and they have been incredible at learning and adapting uh, over the course of the year, really following the science um, and then tailoring our public health response locally um, to the best available science and data, um, tapping into national networks and, and international information and making sure that we were doing the best we possibly could for our community here. Um, at the city level, you know, we stood up an emergency operations center uh, very quickly, and uh, that has also evolved uh, over time, um, but we've been focused on a whole range of things from making sure that city staff had access to protective equipment, um, to upping our cleaning regimes, to um, standing up an entire uh, telework system for those uh, staff who are able to work remotely. Um, I mean, just any number of things involving so many different departments. And I am so incredibly grateful to city staff for the work they've done over the past year, both to the folks on staff that, that worked to make those adjustments and make it possible, for example, for us to have virtual meetings and press conferences, um, among other things, uh, and to find ways to, to continue to deliver our services to the public uh, as safely as possible for all concerned, uh, but also for the folks who just kept coming to work every day. 
and doing their jobs in the middle of a pandemic, um, whether that meant that they were out in the community delivering services or at home dealing with any number of other distractions and issues um, as they were trying to, to do the good work for our community. Our city staff are amazing, um, and they have worked really, really hard over the past year, and I am incredibly grateful for everything they've done. I'm also, frankly, really grateful for our community. Um, our community has shown tremendous generosity um, for each other. We have stepped up in any number of ways to take care of each other, to lift each other's spirits, to bring each other food, um, to make sure that people had shelter, um, access to childcare, uh, access to things that they needed. Um, and that has been a really remarkable thing. Madison is a very generous community um, and very caring community, and I'm grateful uh, for that. And I'm also grateful for each and every one of you that took the public health precautions that we needed to um, in order to keep this virus relatively under control um, throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, so everybody who wore a mask, everybody who washed their hands, everybody who stayed home when maybe they didn't want to, um, we are where we are in part because of your sacrifice and your good work. So thanks to all of you as well. Um, I think we continue the way out of this um, by continuing to get vaccinated, by continuing to wear our masks, um, by continuing to take all the public health precautions that we're advised to take um, until it's really safe to move out of it. And the last thing I'll say is that um, I'm not looking to get back to normal. I'm looking to get back to better. Uh, because we need to not go back to the same um, level of inequality that we saw, to the same racial disparities that we saw. Um, you know, we, we need to move forward. Um, just like we're moving forward in our homeless services, uh, we need to look at every aspect of our community, of our city, um, and get back better, not just get back to normal. So thank you all. Um, I believe that's it, Linda. Those are the questions we can take for today. All right. Uh, well, thank you all very much uh, for tuning in, and we will see you next week.